Hello and welcome to this special interview at The Wire. Today we have with us uh, James Crabtree, who's been a foreign correspondent with the Financial Times for many years in India and has recently written a book called The Billionaire Raj, which describes the journey of some of the major business tycoons of this country and what it, what it means for a country, developing country like India to have as many billionaires as we do. Welcome, James. Thank you. Uh, let's start by talking about how you got the idea and what prompted you over the course of your reporting in India. What what was the point where you thought that there is a billionaire Raj in India and this is a book to write? So I arrived in Mumbai in 2011 and I stayed for five years. And so that was a period of extraordinary change um, in India. And so all around me in the city, there were these industrial tycoons, the like of which that I, as a British person or you know, someone who's an American, you don't have people like this in our countries anymore. And so I turn up in India, and suddenly you have people like Mukesh Ambani or Vijay Malia or Gautam Adani. And I just found them to be fascinating figures. And as I was there, the number of billionaires exploded. You were adding dozens of people every year, and it became increasingly clear that India was adding enormous amounts of wealth uh, at the very top of its society. And so the longer I was there, the more interesting I became in two questions, which is who are these people and you know, what are they like? And what does it mean to have a country that has this much wealth concentrated at the very top? And what did you see uh, when you got access to the, these people, when you met them? What was it like meeting them? What, uh, what did it what did it mean to them to have this kind of wealth in a country like India, as poor as India? Well, so for instance, I met uh, Vijay Malia when he was in London. Uh, now that he, um, as your viewers will know, is a fugitive from justice. Um, and so he, I met him in his mansion in uh, uh, just off Regent's Park, and we have spoke for three or four hours about his circumstances. And typically, when I when you meet these people, there, you know, they're they're clever and, and interesting. Um, India is not like Russia, your, your image of the, the traditional Russian oligarch as a sort of thuggish figure. Now, India's super rich are not like that, they're generally quite charming. Um, and although for some of them there are accusations of cronyism, typically they're also adept businessmen as well. Um, and, and so I think I found them to be fascinating characters and, and that is in a sense what the book is about. I wanted to tell the stories of these people and, and then try and eke out what it is that they mean. So essentially we also saw that through the book coming through that uh, these were like short profiles of each of these businessmen including Mukesh Ambani who you only met briefly over, uh, over the course of uh, five years in Bombay. Well it, India is a very nice place to be a foreign correspondent because you do get excellent access. Um, I mean typically Mr. Ambani is a, a, an interesting case. He doesn't make himself available uh, to many people, and he never really gives interviews. But almost all of the other figures in the book, uh, Gautam Adani, Vijay Malia, uh, the Jindal brothers, uh, Arnab Goswami, uh, the, the, the sort of media tycoon who is one of my chaps. I mean, I got to know all of these people quite well. And so in a sense, I had a level of access as a foreign journalist, particularly because I worked for the Financial Times, um, which allowed me to write these chapters. But there is a, an argument uh, in the book um, you know, I, I argue that there are three major fault lines at the heart of India's economic model, um, which are the rise of the super rich and the inequality that has come with it, firstly. Uh, secondly, problems of crony capitalism, which you at The Wire have uh, um, detailed uh, comprehensively. And then finally, what I call the boom and bust nature of India's investment model, which is also a way of talking about corporate debt and bank debt and the problems that have come along with that. So those three themes run throughout the book. So it is at once, I hope, a readable collection of characters, some of the most fascinating characters who are defining this moment in Indian history. But it's also an argument about how India develops from here. And you also identify some key moments, for example, 91, where India opened up or was forced to open up to the world economy, that key moment when, when Mohan Singh made that speech, a uh, budget speech in uh, 91. And so that was the end of the license Raj. But your argument, uh, the, the period that you have studied in the book is after the 2000s. Correct. And you mentioned that something changed after the 2000s. What, what do you think it was that changed and uh, made sort of these uh, tycoons accumulate the kind of wealth that they have? Well, the short answer is globalization. Um, typically, as you say, people chart India's transformation 
from 1991, the moment of the, uh, the reopening after 40 years of socialism. But I think the real change happened in the middle of the 2000s, that India set in stage the, the conditions for its reopening, but it was only um, at the height of the global economic boom, before the financial crisis, when lots of money was coming into India, uh, when the tycoons were able to raise finance, they went on a big spending spree, the economy boomed, and for a few years it looked like India was going to uh, you know, become a new China, that it would start growing at 10%, and then the wheels completely fell off. But it was in that period in the middle of the 2000s and onwards that the changes that I describe as the billionaire Raj really took hold. That was when the billionaires um, ballooned in number, and it was when inequality really began to soar. It was when you saw the most crony capitalism. This was when all this was happening. It came out five years later during the season of scams, but it was happening in the mid-2000s. Um, and that was when the beginning of the boom that characterized the boom and bust happened. And so in a sense, the India today, you had the 2004 to Modi's election, which is the sort of the boom. And now Modi's term in office, he's really trying to cope with these, with these problems. He's making, a, you know, not a very good job of it in some areas, but in a sense, he's still trying to cope with in areas like reform of the banking system, trying to get investment going, uh, trying to work out how do you, um, you know, get an economy that creates jobs without all of the money going straight to the top. All of these are hangovers from what happened in the middle of the 2000s. And so solving uh, the NPA, the non-performing assets problem, is one of the key challenges that this government has faced. And Arvind Subramaniam, the chief economic advisor till recently, had, had also said that we are shifting to a phase of stigmatized capitalism. So how do you see Mr. Modi's performance in light of the stigmatized capitalism that we see or because of the season of scams? So I don't blame Mr. Modi for the st stigmatized capitalism. Uh, in a sense, this is a still an after effect of the Congress years. What you could say, I suppose, is that he has not been able to come up with a new way of doing things that people do not think is uh, suspicious um, or likely to be crooked. So by stigmatized capitalism, what he means is that any time the government does something that aims to help business, people think, well, this isn't really aimed to help business. This is the result of some deal. Someone's paid someone off. And so the government is in a very difficult position. So you can't fix the bank. To fix the banking system, you've got to basically put lots of money into the banks. You've got to write off some loans. Some of that will involve forgiving debts that have been built up by businessmen because it's in the greater good. But you can't do that here because the politics are too difficult. And so that's partly why um, it, there's been so little progress in fixing the problems of the banking system. There's been moderately more pro, um, progress in uh, the, the bankrupt companies or the effectively bankrupt companies, the industrial groups that took on too much debt. They've made a bit more progress there. But there's been very little progress in the banking system. And that's because to fix that, you need to be quite brave. You, you have, you know, a lot of people have to suffer some pain. Companies have to, the banks have to, and the government have to. In a sense, the taxpayer has to. And they haven't been able to work out how to do that. And so the Modi's record on fixing the banking system is pretty poor. The, the banking system here is in a worse situation now than when he took office. And it's, that's very damaging. In the end, if your banking system isn't working properly, you can't invest. And so it's a big challenge for India. Its growth, headline growth, is doing reasonably well. It's ticking along at 7%, but that's all because of consumption and public investment. In the end, you need to have uh, uh, industrial investment, private sector capital expenditure has to return. It's showing no signs of doing so, or if it is, it's doing so only very gradually. So you think he hasn't been bold enough? Uh, Mr. Modi hasn't been bold enough? I think there's a few things to say about this. Broadly speaking, with one major exception, which is demonetization, uh, Mr. Modi's economic record has been reasonably effective. Uh, he hasn't done anything too stupid. Uh, if you look at the basic facts and figures, um, the fiscal deficit is under control, growth has been relatively high. Um, demonetization was a disaster and one of the most idiotic policy decisions that I think any government has taken anywhere in the world in recent memory. Um, and that has been a big blot on his record for competence. You were here when uh, the after effects of demonetization were being felt. Correct. You were reporting here. So what did you see firsthand? I saw the same thing everyone else saw, which was enormous inconvenience to hundreds of millions of people um, and something that took, if not percentage points, then certainly fractions of percentage points off GDP. And so the Modi loyalists who try and scramble around and find positive effects of demonetization, I mean, with something that profound, then surely there will be some positive effects. And it may be 
that it has had a knock-on effect uh, on uh, tax collection rates or more people are using digital payments, but in no way does that justify the cost. It was not an effective way of dealing with corruption. It was not an effective way of moving the economy towards a more... It was a very stupid policy. Um, and as I say, it will stand as a black mark against Modi's reputation for economic competence, which otherwise would have been reasonably strong. The criticism of him, and I think, you know, so you have to be fair to his achievements, particularly compared to the Congress years. He has actually been a better administrator of India's economy than his predecessors. But he has not been a radical reformer of India's economy. And so you try and think, well, what are the, the major changes that he's managed to get through? And there have been a few. There's been the, the GST that we've been waiting for. But in a whole host of areas that, that you need to begin to develop, Modi has not been able to find a way, or he's not been willing to find a way, of pushing through on you know, big taxation, labor market reforms, all sorts of things. And then you look at the broader set of policies that in, for instance, East Asia, that were critical to East Asia developing, and you have to, you, then you begin to look at basic health, basic education, um, pensions, things that will reform of the agriculture sector so that more people will leave agriculture, um, processes of management of urbanization, all of these things are pretty patchy under Modi. Um, and so in a sense, the kind of radical reforms that India needs, he hasn't been able to do. So you've made the Southeast Asia comparison even in your book. And you've, you've sort of argued that uh, a certain level of collusion uh, going with uh, populism is perhaps good for an economy such as India. Please elaborate on that. Well, if you look at the difference between the North and the South of India, um, you have different models of cronyism. Um, and the model in the South is clearly better than the model in the North. And the model in the South has lots of corruption. So if you look at uh, figures like uh, Jailalita, uh, Karunanidhi, who, who just passed away relatively recently, um, in Andhra, YSR, I mean, these were regimes under which there was undeniably a large amount of corruption, but they were also quite good developmentally, um, both... Uh, I mean, all of the southern states, with the exception of Kerala, which is its own little category on its own, um, have much better human development and much better records of industrialization. They have better infrastructure. They have the beginnings of systems of social support. And almost all of those came along with a lot of corruption. And that was also true in Southeast Asia. I mean, Southeast Asia was even better at it than the southern Indian states at using corruption to sort of grease the wheels of development. Um, and so I just the reason I make this argument is that... Um, you have to understand that corruption is not a is not a kind of bad thing, or it's not an exclusively bad thing. You know, people are corrupt because corruption can be useful; it serves certain purposes. And you have to understand why people are doing it. Now, there's a second question, which is, in a sense, does India require more corruption now um, than it has? Would, if you were to allow a bit more corruption, would this help investment to get going? Um, and I've written about this, and I, I've thought about it quite deeply, and I think the answer is no, that, that you shouldn't allow corruption to come back. But that's mostly because it's not very effective in democratic regimes. The Eastern Asian countries were more autocratic than India is, and so the leaders could promise uh, a, a businessman, you know, if you, you can have a little bit of money uh, beneath the table, but you go and build this irrigation system, this power plant, this road, you know, and everything will work because I'll be here in 10 years' time. But India can't make that kind of commitment to people who are investing, and therefore I think the, the strategic form of corruption is less likely to work. But the consequence of this is that India will grow more slowly um, because it, you know, it's not able to grease the wheels in the way that happens in some other countries. So you have a chapter uh, dedicated to the South, particularly to, to Tamil Nadu. So what did you see? You also, did you, were you able to meet Jailalita at... You were not able. No, I'm, I, so Janelita, unfortunately, she's, there are a number of people who I regret not meeting, but she's probably right at the top of this. She gave interviews to nobody. I mean, even Mr. Ambani at least occasionally will give an interview to Fareed Zakaria or some you know, high-profile visiting foreigner who won't ask him any difficult questions. But Jaya Lalita literally would never, would almost never appeared in public. So I did try. Um, you know, I got to speak to people who, who knew her, who were close to her. Um, but I didn't get to see her. But I did see the after effects of her policies, and that's what, that's what I mean when I say that some people have called this uh, crony populism, uh, you know, that she was a very peculiar mixture. She was an adept uh, sort of crony capitalist in a sense that, that she uh, had particularly latterly had a, a reputation for uh, presiding over certain kinds of corruption, but she was also quite focused on development. And, and so she had a more sophisticated approach. Then you would, for instance, find 
in North India, uh, in Bihar or UP, uh, the type of cronyism that happens there, there's not very much productive activity that happens in U Bihar and UP. So the focus of corruption is much more like looting. It's people, they find somewhere where there is money, typically within the government. There's a, a welfare program for subsidizing this or that. And you try and take as much money of that as you can and then you run away with it. Whereas in the, the southern form of cronyism is much more productive. You find a way of creating what the economists call rents, um, which is sort of extra money that you can take, and then you share it around. You share it between the politicians and the businessmen, between your caste group, with your supporters. Um, and in a sense, the record is that those states have been much more successful. So it isn't the case that areas that are very, very corrupt necessarily don't grow well, because you just have to look at Tamil Nadu and Andhra, and they, they prove that that isn't the case. Cronyism with a certain degree of populism could perhaps work well in an economy such as India. It can do. There is a problem, however, now, which is that all of the things I'm talking about happened prior or largely prior to the season of scams. And so there is now an issue which is that the, the press, um, particularly at the national level, I mean, I think now there's less transparency at the state level, and so it's easier to do kind of cronyism in, um, you know, in Chennai or in, you know, sort of second, third tier cities, just because there's less scrutiny. It's harder to do this now in Delhi. Um, not impossible. Uh, you know, I think uh, one of the lessons that you see of looking at other countries is that corruption returns in different forms at different stages of development. You look at Malaysia now. Um, Malaysia, the kind of corruption you've seen in Malaysia in recent years is quite different from what happened 10 years ago, you know, the, 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 the stage that it has now reached means that cronyism is different industries, different kinds of activities. This is about sort of a sovereign wealth fund that was investing all around the world. It's not about taking 10% of a project to build a canal in, um, you know, in uh, Telangana. Um, but, uh, but still, the point is that corruption under some circumstances can be helpful for investment. And you also wrote about uh, the grand ostentatious displays of wealth of some of these tycoons. You were also invited for uh, Gautam Adani's son's wedding, which, which you declined. Right. And you wrote that you regretted that. I certainly did, yeah, yeah. Well, so I, I got to know Mr. Adani a little bit, and I've met, I met his children once or twice. I also got to know the other side of that, um, that union, uh, where Gautam Adani's son married the daughter of a prominent uh, husband and wife legal team in Mumbai, who I had met from time to time. And yeah, when I just arrived in Mumbai, they, uh, this gentleman arrived at my office one day with a preposterously ornate uh, box in which contained an invitation to the wedding. But at that point, I hadn't met any of them. And so my wife and I thought, well, they must just be being polite. They can't possibly want us to come to the wedding because we don't know any of them. And so that was an amateur. So you hadn't been in touch with them? No, no, they just said, well, I think they, they weren't inviting me. They were inviting the new Financial Times correspondent. Um, and so we being British, or I'm British and my wife's American, we thought, well, we can't really go. We don't know them. And we didn't yet know. No one had told us that you don't have to know anyone to go to an Indian wedding. So, um, But I think at a deeper level, the culture of weddings, I mean, Indian weddings have been excessive uh, long before the era of reforms and globalization. But in a sense, weddings have, you know, they've become a whole new thing about the display of wealth and to some degree a kind of form of global sophistication that if you are a super rich uh, Indian now, you demonstrate your um, your elite status by the kind of wedding that you have. So you look at um, uh, the uh, Arsula Mittal. Uh, so Mr. Mittal, uh, his daughter was married in the Palace of Versailles, and I think they had, I don't know, Shakira or Kylie Minogue, and they flew everyone into France. And so this is a kind of demonstration of the sophistication of your wealth. Um, and they also are you know, there are moments in which the the governing elite, the business and political elite, can all come together sort of neutrally and renew their connections because, you know, these are the, the, the Adani Shroff wedding. Everybody was there, you know, everyone in my book was there in one place in Goa, including Modi, um, both Ambani brothers, uh, you know, that everyone was there. And so this is a sort of weddings play this peculiar function in India. Speaking of uh, ostentatious displays of wealth, Mukesh Ambani's house in Bombay, you've also spoken about his house and um, given vivid descriptions of what that house looks like. And you've also chosen that as the cover for one edition of the book. But uh, your the edition which you've launched in India doesn't have uh, that image on the cover. Why is that? And why was that 
uh, image chosen as the cover for one of these editions? Well, so I chose the, the I think, Antilia, which is Mukesh Ambani's house in, in downtown Mumbai, which is his residential skyscraper for him and his wife and his three kids, what they call the billion dollar house, although you know that's just what they call it. We don't really know how much it costs to build. That was sort of the icon of India's Gilded Age. It's a remarkable building. Um, in a sense, it tells you something about the nature of India's extremes of wealth, that it's only here that such a building exists. There's no comparable building in America, there's no comparable building in China, nowhere else in the world have I come across. Even in Brazil, I haven't come across a building that is quite as extreme um, as Antilia in terms of what it says about the, the wealth and power of the richest man in the country. And so. The opening chapter of the book is about Mr. Ambani. When I was a correspondent in Mumbai, I used to go by that building every day, once on the way uptown, once on the way down, and it, it sort of stood there as a testament to the extreme wealth in India. And so I always wanted it to be the cover of the book, and so it's the cover of some of the editions. Um, in India, the publishers were n nervous about um, the legal issues that a book like this would represent, and so the book was very carefully uh, lawyered and they decided that they wanted to go with a different cover so we have a we have a, a, a cover that also displays the disparities of wealth but one that doesn't have Mr. Ambani's house on the front. And um, so you've also spoken about good and bad billionaires and you've argued that the tech industry in India which gave it gave it a lot of billionaires in the 90s and isn't doing so anymore uh, but there are these other sectors which are closer to the government where the government has more control where there are more rents to be sought is now giving the billionaires and these you imply are the bad billionaires. Elaborate a little on that. Well, so I should say this is not my original construction. So Ruchir Sharma, uh, the author, and Morgan Stanley investor was the one who sort of basically came up with this division between good and bad billionaires, although others have done similar work. So the, the basic point is this, that there are some people who think probably that all billionaires are bad. Now, I'm not one of those. I, I think as long as people get spectacularly wealthy by running great businesses. If you're you know, Steve Jobs and you create a business that delivers an enormous amount of value to people, then as long as you pay your taxes and your taxes are sort of reasonably hefty because you're rich and you behave responsibly in other ways, you are you know, philanthropic and reasonable, then that's fine, you know, best of luck to you. The problem comes if you're making your money uh, either partly or substantially, not because you're good at running a business, um, but because you have friends in politics and they're doing favors for you. And so in India, you have both of those things. The, the classic distinction, as you say, is between the IT billionaires who were the first round of wealth creation after 1991. After 1991, you had this 10-year period where there were not very many billionaires created, but most of them were good. So IT, um, generic pharmaceuticals, a few other areas, healthcare. Um, uh, and it was in the mid-2000s, the period that I write about, that you had this explosion of wealth where a lot of the money was coming in what economists call the rent-thick sectors, which are mining, um, heavy industry, property, um, the, the things where to get anything done at all, telecoms to, to some degree, although that's a bit of a mixture of the two, to get anything done at all, you needed the permission of the government, and that was just an invitation to cronyism, because the politicians had discretion over things that you need, land, mining rights, 2G telecom spectrum most famously, um, and therefore this squalid economy uh, emerged. When you talk about crony capitalism, what you mean by crony capitalism, the definition is collusion between the business and political elites. And so clearly in India, in the mid-2000s, there was massive collusion going on around the cabinet table in Delhi. Um, and that was one of the things that was so damaging to India's reputation. And in a sense, that was so a large portion of the wealth that was being created over that period was not the result of people setting up competitive, world-beating businesses. It was people who knew people in Delhi and sort of got them to do them favors. And you also write a lot about political funding and how that is a major source of problem or, or sort of there is a circle of political funding and then benefits being given to those who provide the funding. What did you see as you came in uh, as a foreign correspondent? Did it surprise you, the extent to which this goes on? So again, I can't claim original ownership. So what you're talking about was a conversation based on a conversation that I had with Raghu Ram Rajan, the central bank governor, and he was an influential figure. In addition to being a central banker, he's a, an interesting intellectual. And so he had ideas about this. And so I talked to him often and took some ideas from him. And, and it, he was the one who gave me this idea about the the kind of the circular economy of cronyism and the, the gist of that is that 
because the Indian government is not very good at providing ordinary people what they need, um, you get your kid into a school, get access to water, whatever it might be, you know, get a certificate, get something the state needs, then the politicians provide that. They become the gatekeepers for public goods. And uh, in order to do that, they need to raise money. They need to raise money both to fight elections, but also to some degree to kind of fund patronage machines in order to raise that money. Then they need to go to businessmen. The businessmen want favors, da 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 It sort of goes round in circles. And so the argument about that is the only way you really break that, um, firstly, you have to you know, have much more transparency and you have to have more investigations from the police. But in the long run, you have to be able to provide an alternative to the corrupt cronyistic system. In America, it really took um, you know, almost 60 years to do this. It was only properly broken during the New Deal when you had the beginnings of a social welfare state, which was uh, properly funded and neutral with respect to individual groups. And in a sense, that's the long run problem that India has to do. You can't break this cycle of clientelism and patronage politics until such time as you give people a different option, which is you know, a reasonable, well-funded system of social support and investment and a well-functioning market. So you made the comparison with America's Gilded Age, which was the late 19th century. But America transformed, the institutions got stronger, democracy got stronger. Do you see that happening in India as well, or do you see India going in the other direction towards more inequality? I mean, it's a complicated picture. I, I say in the book that I am optimistic about India's future, and I mean that in the sense that I'm theoretically optimistic. If you were to go to America in 1880, you would have seen an economy that looked a little bit like bits of India's today. You know, the rich were making out like bandits. The politicians were often very corrupt. Uh, there weren't very many public goods being provided. Um, the intellectual liberal elite were scandalized by the behavior of their financial and political elite. Um, and yet, as you say, over a 20, 30, 40 year period, things improved dramatically for a whole range of reasons, uh, some of which were to do with uh, institutions, the fact that uh, they had a much more robust competition policy, they broke up the big corporations so that there was not as much entrenched corporate power, but you also had a reassertion uh, of control over politics by the middle classes. This was a period of rapid urbanization in America. The city of Chicago had 90,000 people um, in 1865 and more than a million people in 1900. Now that is peanuts compared to what's going to happen in India over the next 20 or 30 years where you have 300 million people moving from villages into towns and cities. And while that is a terrifyingly difficult prospect to manage, given particularly the state of India's urban infrastructure, it should have, if it is delivered successfully, successful outcomes, which is you will have a much, much larger urban middle class, and that urban middle class is going to make demands on the political system that should be conducive to economic and social progressive reform. So, you know, India is not Russia. A decade ago, there was a genuine worry that India was heading in the direction of Russia and that you would have a, a, a sort of oligarchy um, in which the politicians were in the pockets of the big businessmen um, and the big businessmen were acting only in their own uh, self-interest. That threat, to my mind, has receded partly because of the public outrage over the season of scams and to some degree due to Modi. I think he deserves a bit of credit. He has clearly read the riot act both to his own government and to the tycoons. And so there's just less of that air of Russianness. Equally, India's economy is much more vibrant than Russia's. Uh, it has problematic areas, but there are also areas of strength. You, we've talked about IT and startups. You know, there's a lot of globally competitive businesses in India. And so there are reasons for optimism. You also have the talents of the Indian people, uh, a huge population yearning for aspiration, which everywhere else in the world is astonishingly successful. But we still don't see a great deal of optimism when it comes to investment. For instance, apart from uh, Mukesh Ambani, which you also write about, that there, we haven't seen a revival of uh, domestic investment in, in, in the economy. Why do you think that is despite uh, Narendra Modi's record as the Chief Minister of Gujarat? and uh, his claims of having revived Gujarat and de delivered double-digit growth in Gujarat. Well, I mean, this goes back to what we were talking about before. It's what um, they, the economists call the twin balance sheet problem, uh, which is the third theme of my book, The Boom and Bust Cycle. Um, the Indian the backbone of the Indian industrial uh, corporate sector uh, has horrible balance sheet problems. They took on too much debt. They, many of them are effectively bankrupt. So as you say, with the exception of uh, Mr. Ambani and his uh, fantastically expensive geo project. Most of these companies, you know, from Tata and Birla through to the property companies, they're not spending much money. Um, you know, they're worried 
that the investment model that they used to prosper isn't there anymore and their balance sheets are in a mess. Um, some of them are technically bankrupt, but even those that are not are more cautious now than they used to be. But the big problem is the banking system. In the end, you need a well-functioning, well-capitalized banking system, and India's banking system has a ratio of non-performing loans to assets of about 18%. Could be higher, but we think it's probably about 18%, and that's massive. That's by that's much larger than China um, in the particular area of of uh, the, the corporate lending. And so until you clean up your banks, uh, it's perfectly possible to have a lost decade of industrial investment. Look at Japan. Um, if you let your banks sort of uh, limp on, and that's effectively what India is doing at the moment. Mr. Modi has, although he has tried various ways of doing this, he has not succeeded in finding a way of recapitalizing um, and reforming the public sector banking system. And so until that happens, uh, growth is going to be, uh, industrial investment growth is going to be subdued. And finally, you also have a chapter on dedicated to cricket in your book. Mm -hmm. And what is the gentleman's game doing in a book about cronyism? Well, I mean, cricket actually is a fantastic example of exactly what I've been talking about. And in a sense, it's almost the best example of where India is going because, you know, there are many industries uh, in the world in which India plays an important part. Um, if you are a global company, uh, you have to have an Indian investment strategy. You could be a car maker, you could be a pharmaceutical maker, but, but in the end, India is going to become one of the world's largest economies, and so everyone has to take it seriously. That wasn't true 10 years ago. It definitely is true now. But in almost no sector is India the world's dominant power. But in cricket, India is the world's dominant power, and I don't mean that in a sporting sense, although that is also true. Um, well, typically it's true, uh, but it's certainly financially. I mean, India is the world's cricket superpower. Um, it takes in more money for cricket than miles more than all the rest of the other cricketing nations combined. And so global cricket is basically now an Indian fiefdom. And if you look at what's happened, you have the same combination of sort of optimism and pessimism that you find in other areas. So optimism, India's taking control of cricket, in a sense, in some ways, has been good. Uh, there's been a lot of investment in new cricket stadiums in India. You have the 2020 form of the game, which Indians like, which in a sense has revitalized global cricket. But it's come along with all of the same problems. It, there was cronyism and corruption in cricket. Uh, there was uh, conflicts of interest in which the, 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 the story I tell in the book is predominantly about 2013 and the, the scandal that emerged uh, in the Indian Premier League, the, the cricket tournament. Uh, in that year, which was primarily, a, initially it was a sporting scandal, but it revealed all sorts of conflicts of interest between the cricketing tycoons who not only owned the teams, they owned the league, they ran the governance board. It was pretty clear that, that Indian cricket in various ways was suffering problems um, of cronyism. And then you add on that people like Lalit Modi, the former commissioner of the IPL, who's another one of these sort of tycoons who are now fugitives from justice. And in the middle of that, you just have a compelling story of great wealth creation, innovation, but also corners being cut and corruption. And in a sense, I think cricket fits perfectly within the narrative of my book about the the, the explosion of possibility and wealth in India, but also the big problems that have come with that. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.